I mean, yes, it is a fetish, but also one that needs to happen every time. Yeah, it's like a fetish, but like the most mainstream fetish. <laughs> <laughs> a fetish we can all get on board with. <laughs> We smoke weed and we talk about the mysteries in our universe and beyond. Beyond our universe. I'm Colin. I'm Tristan. I'm Robert. Uh, you know us. You love us. It's time for the show. Yes, it We're is. We're gonna smoke some we hope weed. You love us. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you could just you like me. Love to hate us. I mean, yeah, I ain't got no time for that hate. Hopefully, you love me. <laughs> I mean, if you do hate, I feel like. We need to give you a hug. That's yeah, what you really I, I, we got nothing but love for you. We tend to get more love comments on our YouTube videos. A lot of people asking us to follow them and like them. So we haven't had too many like go to hell and die kind of. Uh, stuff. No, maybe like one uh, or two like yeah, stupid one, hippies. Yeah, yeah, maybe <laughs> maybe a few stupid hippie ones, but well, that's right. uh, yeah, yeah, we we get we get our share. <laughs> um, oh yeah, I did write down my weed strains today oh, with, guys. with the percentages. How can you hate a, such a well prepared podcast? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Honestly, like we do, like I mean, I do I tell, diligence. Ethical. Yeah, I hope y'all know we do put a lot of work into the show. Yes, <laughs> even, if, even if it doesn't come across. <laughs> Blood, sweat, tears, everything. Today I have a high hemp pineapple paradise wrap. Same. Uh, inside of it, I have these three strains. Strains from Inhalant Farms, oh, uh, Hindu Kush, mm-hmm. which is at 26% THC, Wi-Fi, which is at 23% THC, Riffy. and Blue Dream, which comes ah. in right in the middle at a 24%. Big fan THC. of the Blue Dream. I've also got two uh, strains from Cypress Cannabis. That's the grower. Uh, I got Sour Kosher, which is a 21%. And cherry punch, which is at twenty three percent. These numbers are huge, even in the uh, lower cost strains. So mm. I'm happy. Excellent. Okay. And to your like uh, blue dream point, I feel like it's one of the more popular sativas, just because it's like a pretty mellow sativa. Like it is still up, but you're not gonna be like everyone knows I'm high and you yeah. can hear my hair grow. There's yeah. a reason it's called Blue Dream and not Green Crack. Yeah. <laughs> Which there is a strain called Green yes, Crack. Yes, yes. And I love it. Yes. <laughs> um, I have a Twisted Hemp wrap. It's in the sweet flavor, which is reminiscent of like Swisher Sweets. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the special green wrap that you see on most things, right? Hmm? The greens are often like the... Uh, am I talking? <laughs> Did I miss something entirely? Like the like the sweet greens, sweet. Greens. You know the green leaf wrap on uh, blunts, like old school blunts. There, there's brown leaf wraps and there's green leaf wraps, and I, the sweets usually had the green. I guess I kind of know what you're talking about. I'm thinking more just like the Swisher brand. It's like the little mini cigars, and like mm-hmm. I feel like even if those were a darker color, it still had like the same sweet flavor to it. Sure. There's actually a specific Swisher sweet. I think that's called oh. the sweet greens or sweets. Oh uh, no! I I only did the the regular like red reddish copper Swisher sweets. Yeah, which I yeah. think this is more emulating because even the wrapper itself is like has that red mm-hmm. silver tone or whatever. Yeah, the distinction was very important to me at one point. It was back when I smoked tobacco wraps. Mm-hmm. Now I just smoke high hemp. Well, the beers. distinction is hemp. <laughs> yeah, yes. for sure. It's a half wrap. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. yes um, and so the weeds that I have in this is uh, the banjo sativa, which <laughs> is at eighteen percent, and the sunset sherbet, which is at fifteen uh, percent. Banjo sativa sounds like a hero farmer from Kentucky who's like refusing to stop growing weed. <laughs> <laughs> 
You're all need weed in Kentucky. Come on down and see Banjo Sativa. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, a better version right. of the Tiger King. Oh, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> Only he doesn't, like, take advantage of young men and yeah. <laughs> just, like, use drugs against them and horrifying things. Yeah, nobody's saying, oh, no, Banjo Sativa's in town. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> It's more like, holy shit, Banjo's here. Free weed, everybody. <laughs> Hell yeah. Uh, I, too, have a Pineapple Paradise High Hemp Wrap. Mm, I and... thought you were going to say, I, too, have Banjo Sativa. <laughs> uh, no, I have an Indica. That's what I want to get. Match. Um, Banjo Indica. <laughs> Banjo Indica. <laughs> Uh, which you don't want him. He's more like the Tiger King. Right. <laughs> He's, He's definitely... really sleepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'd be like the Slowpoke Rodriguez to the Speedy Gonzalez. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, both very racist. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. But that's okay. But memorable from yeah, my childhood. you know who we're talking about. Um, <laughs> it is packed with King Louis the Thirteenth, uh, mm-hmm. and the THC content is twenty point seven nine percent. Boom. I feel like you smoked that the last couple of weeks. You're gonna have to start smoking more weed, Rob. <laughs> I strains. do tend to get uh, the, a lot of the same inhalants brand indicas, and they don't really have a high selection of their indicas at exhalants. Got to go out of brand. Like that crew cannabis is pretty good. Uh, I just tried uh, recently. I can't remember the name perfectly, but it was the Four Corners strain. And I liked that a lot. And it was uh, sustainably sourced and small batch farmers, which I don't really care. Grow a giant field, whatever. But mm-hmm. it was just kind of like boutique and cool. And, yeah. yeah, I had an issue with, um, oh, whatever that brand was that gave me a bunch of stems and seeds and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, inhalants brand seems to be doing. You got burned one right. time and you were like, never again. <laughs> no, no, never again. Why am I? Because spe- I mean, especially now when I'm spending a lot more than I was previously spending on just an eighth or a quarter. Yeah. Right. And You're so I'm your like, eighth and then multiplying that by two or yeah. three. <laughs> and so like, I'm like, well, I want to get something that I know is going to be, that's going to work. I'm not going to be disappointed. All I want is not to be disappointed. I don't want to be wowed or amazed. Just don't disappoint me. <laughs> oh, I want to be wowed and amazed. I want to feel like somebody smacked my forehead. Uh, yeah, I want to say that's a sad existence, but at the same time, if I'm smacking you, you know, do, do you, Rob? I don't know. <laughs> On that note, please roll a joint, pack a blunt. We are putting the tips of our blunts together. That's me. Like this blunt, we hope that you can smoke alongside us. Light that blunt, we are lighting that blunt. Okay, blunts are lit. It's my mystery today, and if you couldn't tell from that intro, we have more mysteries from The Office. (laughs) NBC's The Office. That's right. Known and beloved. What is this? Uh, Known and beloved sitcom across all of America and most of the UK for the... The Office US. Yeah, we're talking a little bit about both offices today, but mostly we are concerning the US version of The Office. We talked a lot on a previous episode about the Scranton Strangler, and that was enough for its own episode because we had to profile so many people. But... Yeah. This concerns all the other mysteries, fan theories, etc. that have cropped up around the show. I will be the voice for people who know of the show but did not watch it religiously enough to like <laughs> really know what the hell is going on with a lot of this. So I'll be that voice. And to that point, uh, did they ever do an episode where like the two offices met each other? <laughs> Hold your roll, Tristan. Oh, <laughs> Slow your roll, sir. We'll get there. Jesus, Tristan. <laughs> I'm blowing it. I'm blowing it. <laughs> it's okay. We're going to talk about it. Uh, what was I going to say? Uh, I lost my train of thought. Well, that is a question someone who doesn't watch the show might have. For... I've seen all the episodes. I've watched them the one time through. 
And then Colin puts it on religiously in the background. Yep. So I've seen it more than I would like to have seen it. It like sneaks in your room while you're sleeping. <laughs> I find it to be one of the most rewatchable pieces of media in all of existence. Uh, I've seen it through probably 11 or 12 times in its entirety. And we're talking about 10 seasons of television. So I've seen it quite a, quite a few times. Uh, I like to put it on before bed. It's, you know, pretty quiet everything I want. Um, yeah, it's so. hard for me to like rewatch things over right? and over and over again. Um, mm -hmm. I will say a go-to that I can usually watch a lot of is pretty much any Adam Sandler movie. It's what? gonna like make me... <laughs> if it's like, if an Adam Sandler movie is on TV, I'll probably watch it. Yeah, yeah. You can do it. You yeah. can do it all night. Got you. <laughs> um, I am a huge fan of rewatching media. No surprise. Uh, I find you don't find things the first viewing that you do on the second or third, and even to that point, the 30th or 50th or 100th time. <laughs> Believe it or not. Subtle nuances <laughs> of the performance. And I'm not saying every film deserves that kind of return, but... I don't know if you guys saw this, but in scene 12 of episode <laughs> 3, or, he has a weird winky thing going on. Oh, What's yeah, happening yeah, there? Let's see that. But yeah, I've seen The Office a lot. I think I would be a boss at any Office trivia night. If you need somebody, let me know. So we're going to go through a bunch of small mysteries that The Office has, and we'll talk about a few theories, and I'll point out things from the show, etc. The first one up on the list is that the two biggest dullards in The Office, Kevin and Michael, are secret geniuses. Okay. And when you say dullards, you mean they're like the... Dum-dums. Okay. The dummies. The... Um, okay, I mean, I know that Kevin, who... Uh, well, let's let's start with Michael. Just to, okay, okay, okay. Michael's so, the boss. Michael's the boss. We see him do all kinds of antics throughout the office all the time, and they usually uh, don't go right. They usually blow up in his face. He's, exactly, he's and he's not very tactful. And yet, we see him go out to dinner uh, in one of the early seasons and just nail a sale. Just perfectly figure out how to take Tim Meadows out to dinner talk to him exactly the right way to close this big account that they weren't otherwise going to commit. Happy accident or? Secret genius. <laughs> <laughs> the man can say. And the idea behind this theory is that Michael Scott has always been acting as this secret, as this buffoon in order to motivate and manipulate people. I mean, it is something that people do. Like, there's a lot of really smart women out there who feel like they've can play into like the stereotype of being dumb or whatever to like manipulate Absolutely. the situation or get what they want. Yeah. And like, uh, regardless of gender, I think right. men do the exact same thing. Like, I definitely think there are pretty boys who are like, oh, I don't know, <laughs> play that shit up. So, <laughs> but yeah, so that's the idea behind Michael being a secret genius. Kevin, on the other hand, what were you gonna say, Rob? Uh, I mean, he can make a good chili. <laughs> <laughs> but he is I don't know always been very dumb indeed uh, he did come into my bank once though the oh. actual first that's good <laughs> <laughs> at some point during the show Kevin buys a bar he also talks about a friend of his who got arrested for uh, embezzling I'm pretty sure and he says uh, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what I do here <laughs> he actually says he had to have his friend explain it to him three times just to make sure, which doesn't necessarily support his secret yeah, genius. No. But uh, he also lost at poker on poker night, and he was supposed to be really good at that, so he lost money. Oh, I don't remember that as well. Oh, snap. Oh, what? Yeah, when they have the, the casino night and the thing, he's playing poker and he's like talk, boasting about how good at poker he is, and then he, like, loses everything on the first hand. He goes, I suck. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to fact check that one. I definitely remember him <laughs> taking money from Daryl and Andy during a game of Dallas. He outwits both men by making it seem like they stole the money when he, in fact, stole the money. Okay. Yeah. So He's also very good at basketball. Shows him hitting all these three-point shots. No, 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 no. It's not Kevin, is it? You're thinking of Phyllis, right? No. <laughs> we did, now, now, God, I can't, now we're getting all our lines My crossed God. on the office. But I was going to say, if indeed he is the Scranton Strangler or whatever, then his 
act of being the dumb one is genius. Yeah, absolutely. Or even if it's just to embezzle. Right. You know, even if he's just playing dumb so that he can fudge Dunder Mifflin's numbers and take money for himself or whatever. Which, Which, I don't know, if you need someone to explain to you that you are embezzling. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Three times over. (laughs) But anyway, so that's the first of these theories, is that either of those guys is a secret genius. Okay. Uh, another mystery surrounding the office is, what did Jim's notes say? On a specific episode of The Office okay. where they have a secret Santa exchange, Jim writes a note which he puts into a teapot, and when Pam finally actually ends up with the teapot, he sneaks the note back into a, his pocket. Like he decided not to... Send not to reveal his feelings or whatever it says in the note. Now, several years later, Jim had held on to this note this entire time. And when him and Pam are hitting a rough spot because he's living in Philly and leaving her behind and things get kind of weird, that's when he finally gives her the note. And it's enough to make her, I guess, emotional and ready to forgive him and et cetera, et cetera. And show it. And they never tell us what's in the note. The note says, I'm the Scranton Strangler. If you don't want <laughs> yeah. me, I'll kill you. <laughs> I know where all of your family lives. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ingrained into your network now. There's nothing you can do. Oh, God, I hope it's not that dark. Just Is that like, not one of the theories? Did I not? <laughs> <laughs> it's just an illustration of his wiener. Like yeah. A, an old school dick it's, it's, it folds out. And it's like, yep, that yeah. big. <laughs> <laughs> just the simple three words, I love you. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Uh, in similar fashion, there's a mystery around what Michael said to Pam. On the day that Michael is leaving Scranton for good, Oh yeah. Uh, Pam actually says she's going to Price Printers or something similar and goes to see a movie. Mm-hmm. And Michael is already gone when she returns. So she has to rush to the airport. She goes through security. So they both have their microphones off because they've just gone through airport security. And Michael says something to her. That is comforting and special and whatever, and mm-hmm. nobody knows what they said except people who can read lips. Mm. <laughs> Any lip readers out yeah, there? I yeah, I mean, I was about to say if, if lip readers can know what they say, then I'm surely it's out there. But I here's mean, the real do. question: Were the actors really saying what the characters were saying, or at that point were they just ad libbing and having fun? And so that's not when you read the lips, or it's like <laughs> she jibbity jabbity boo. Jenna Fisher runs up to Steve Carell, and he's just like. Watermelon toothpick. Right? <laughs> Cabbage patch dolls. <laughs> Just absolute nonsense. Uh, so, yeah, that's one of the questions up in the air. Uh, another one is, like, why does Michael hate Toby? Hold so, on. Are there any other, like, known speculations about what was said? Not really. Except that Michael has had this, like, sort of fatherly role to Pam. And, like, always... She's definitely been his favorite in the office. Mm-hmm. No question. Like, when they had their baby, he, like, lost his mind. And Maybe that's what he said. He's just like, just so you know, you're my favorite. Could <laughs> well, be. I remember I used to um, rent the DVDs of shows from Blockbuster. Oh, wow. wow. Throwback. Yeah. For you kids out there, before Netflix, you had to get movies on these hard copies. And there was a place where you would go and get those hard copies. <laughs> and before it was a machine that would just dispense yeah, these yeah, hard yeah. copies yeah. in a full store. Yeah, with a person who actually like, checked it out and tried to sell you popcorn right, and juju Yeah. <laughs> so that's a blockbuster. Yeah, that's a blockbuster, right? <laughs> that's a blockbuster. Um, so. I'll take seven. <laughs> I'm the best investor in the world. <laughs> uh, so I would rent these things. Um so I could listen to the director commentary. Okay. Um, because you, if you can watch them, but you won't get that commentary. Right. And I was like st- training, studying, hoping, wishing that I was going to be a television writer in Hollywood. Okay. And so... Still a very accomplishable <laughs> sure, dream. I tell sure. Sure. All the time. Sure. <laughs> um, but, uh, and I was like listening to these commentaries because I was hoping they'd give some insight right. or something like that. 
because uh, a lot of it Did was it not ever happen. You're talking about it like you never got any insight from. All I, I mean, I got a little bit here and there, spots and specs. So it was worth it, is what he's saying. Sure. Oh, definitely. I mean, they're funny and they're you know a different viewing of your episodes. Absorb any, all the knowledge you can. <laughs> anywho, I believe they had a commentary of that episode, and I think they talked about it, but. They didn't give I don't it. think they gave any specifics or anything like that. It might have been something as innocuous as like, hey, Steve Carell, what are you going to be doing after work? Is there going to be like a, a get together or something like shit like that where they're just fucking talking? Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you hot? I'm hot right now. It's really hot, right? These lights are hot. Are you hot? <laughs> LAX is always hot. Seriously. <laughs> I think they said they didn't actually have any like actual written, written line. lines or anything. Well, if I know anything about, like, Steve Carell, the dude is one of the most committed people in all of Hollywood. Like, if you watch his old Dana Carvey stuff, his vein is legitimately, like, yeah. exploding out of his forehead. Yeah. Scary. Yeah, and dude yeah. commits. It takes years of training of that <laughs> yeah, right? vein in your forehead. <laughs> to commit that hard yeah. to something. My point being, I think he probably said lines as Michael Scott and, okay, you know, yeah. delivered a real character moment. I mm. doubt very much that it was, like, we're saying. It's true. And also, like, I like to think that if you're, like, a giving actor, you're a team player, you want to give the other team player the other actor like yeah. something actual to work off of something like absolutely a real moment yeah Def. yeah tristan and i are that kind of actor yes. we're givers we're givers <laughs> 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 uh the next little mystery we've got quite a few uh how does or why does michael hate toby so very much i mean i first off most hate stems from jealousy so there's got to be something in him that he feels that he can't express or he can't do like maybe he sees him like being his genuine self and he feels he can't do that so he hates on him like that's usually where hate comes from sure i think it's the antithesis of michael scott and it's also the one person in the office he really doesn't have any control <laughs> over so it's it's and it's like a whole he's not part of the group he's on the outside of the group like policing yeah, the he's, group he's corporate he's yeah. a corporate entity that works in scranton yeah so he really works for new york so i guess that yeah. that outsider theory is a pretty good one thank you uh hey. he definitely points out how much he hates toby going out of his way to make him not go to beach day ruining all kinds of things like making sure that toby doesn't get a robe when corporate gives out robes <laughs> at christmas uh, he even said he would, when he was in a room with Bin Laden and Hitler and he had, and Toby, and he had two bullets, he would shoot Toby twice. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's pretty next level how much Michael hates Toby. And the two main theories out there are that, like, he's just reported that much. Like, Michael gets in trouble constantly. There's constantly people who are doing seminars because of what Michael said or did. So he just... Hates Toby for the obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. The other big fan theory is that he sees how much Toby has a crush on Pam. And so he's like coming from a protective place and like trying You're to. You're not good enough, Pam. Exactly. Or even a jealous place because Michael's definitely a bit of a creeper with Pam yeah. early on. So the, those are the two. Pulling like, a Biden and just like smelling her from behind. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Weird stuff like that. <laughs> That all presidential candidates do, apparently. <laughs> um, At least lately. Yeah. <laughs> I liked the idea that they had some kind of cross-the-line-of-straightness interaction. And okay. So this has been... Like they got crazy reaction. at an office party one night and sure. like shared a kiss or something. And now or like that episode of South Park, two guys masturbate in a hot tub. Oh, yeah. Something like that. And then so as a reaction, Michael's always like overcompensated since. I don't know. We'll never know why Michael hates Toby so much, but we know he does. I mean, yeah, I would definitely <laughs> say it's because he's not part of the office. Because he's a corporate entity. Yeah, yeah, HR. I mean, you just got to hate him. This one's a really brief one, but I, I just like the idea that people pointed out. We see Bob Vance introduce himself constantly. Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration. And there's a theory going around that Bob Vance figured out that he could do that and advertise his business, not to the people he's meeting, but to everyone who's watching the documentary. Okay. So that Bob Vance is just this brilliant businessman who figured out 
if I introduce myself, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration, they have to air it on the show, and I get free ads every single time. Yeah, I mean, if <clears throat> that makes sense, like, if it's, we're assuming this is, like, a reality situation, that this, like, is a real camera crew following a real office or whatever. Right. They're like, a good businessman, if you're in front of a camera, advertise your business. Def. Sure. And just in general, mm-hmm. even uh, outside the show, I'm sure if you introduce yourself, Bob Vance, Vance Refrigeration, it's great selling. It's great marketing. It's yep. great fucking you. They know you. Right. You know, and then you, they might have a question or a concern about refrigeration. It's like, you know what? My refrigerator's is on the fritz. <laughs> I got What's a fritz guy? fridge. Bob Vance? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you introduced yourself. You're in refrigeration, huh? I was thinking about that. Yes, I, just, I want a truck full of refrigerators. <laughs> Unless, of course, you believe that Bob Vance is saying his name that way every time he needs someone because he's trying to convince them that he is Bob Vance and not the Scranton Scran- Strangler. You sure. Know? <laughs> yeah. Right, it's almost like he doth protest too much. Yeah. <laughs> He's definitely bragging, we can agree on that. You know? Yeah. I'm a business owner. Respect me. <laughs> <laughs> Another weird detail in the show is Andy Dwyer's name. So what's the deal with Andy's name? He said when he was born that he was named Walter Jr. and then his older brother or his little brother was born and they renamed him Andrew. Uh his father was introduced as both Walter and Andrew at separate times on the show. Andy would also try to be Drew after he came back from anger management and tried to identify as a new identity. Yeah, cool laid back. Yeah. And we've noticed on the show that, like, he loves nicknames and has a ton of them. He's the boner champ. He's the nard dog. So clearly Uh, he doesn't like his name, or he has, like, some weird something baggage going on with the name we don't know but whatever the case there's something weird there even when even with his like college nicknames like he's supposed to be the boner champ or whatever well when we see steve uh <clears throat> colbert come on as a guest of the show he says that he's the boner champ and there's a lot of confusion with like the new who is universe. the boner champ exactly who is the boner champ well, and how do you get that name right <laughs> I mean, have, multiple yeah. cock push-ups. I'm assuming. <laughs> I'm assuming, yeah, like... <laughs> I hope that's what it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's uh, he also likes to give out nicknames. Yeah, Tuna. Tuna. Yep. Uh, and like so many others. I think he gives a nickname for everybody in the I office. I was going to say, if we could have all his nicknames, it would be nuts. It'd be like Pamalama Ding Dong or something like that. <laughs> Uh, this one goes back, we touched on it during the, uh, Scranton Strangler one. We also have a picture of this character. <gasps> We've asked it before, but it oh, should yeah. be asked twice. Who it is? Who is Luann? Not that one. <laughs> <laughs> I should have stick with you. Uh, Luann. <laughs> we just had a funny moment where Rob put up the wrong picture on Twitch. It's okay, it's fine. Luann is a character that we see in several shots across several seasons. Uh, She's a woman known only as Luann. We don't know who she is. We don't know why she's there. And we never get any kind of interview or even an audible line from Luann. So presumably she's never been mic'd on the show. I feel like she might just be like a producer or something. Casting director. Well, no. We do know (laughs) that she has a desk in the office. Her desk sits across from Toby's in the annex next to the kitchen. Uh, And we see, that's how we know her name. Mm -hmm. We see a special award on her desk that has the name Luann Kelly. Uh, She, the only things we for sure know about Luann is that she has a signature mini water fountain, like a water cooler, excuse me, on her desk and many plants. And her last physical appearance of her face was on season three. However, after that point, her desk continues to be used and, like, disheveled, and her little signature water cooler is still there. So for all intents and purposes, we assume she continued on at Dunder Mifflin after season three, even though we don't see her. Huh. Yeah, and then the other notable thing about Luann is that her appearance changes pretty dramatically. Uh, every single time we see her, she has a very different haircut, even changing colors. 
and she sometimes wears glasses and sometimes doesn't, and she just looks really different each time you see her. So, who is Luann? I would love to do a like a little documentary or something, a, a mockumentary, if you will, of her character. As if it, if it were her own office spinoff or something like that. Just a quick little film oh, where man. it explains why she changed her look and why she's only there like three or four times and then yeah. gone. That would be a really solid little spinoff show. Right? Like, I would watch that. <laughs> and like she, we only get those few moments like where she sits at her desk. And we like pan out and we see the whole cast of the office. <laughs> and then they go right back to her and it just follows her. And they, we don't talk about anybody from the office. It's, it's <laughs> their show like, for one scene. As boring and funny as it possibly could be, where she's like spending an entire eight hours trying to like unfold some post its <laughs> yeah. or like trying how to take a post it off the perfect way. I would watch 30 minutes of that. Yes. I would. <laughs> I want to see her story be a fucking crazy mystery. <laughs> Some people yeah. think she's a, another corporate entity like Toby, but um, the assumption would be that she'd be HR. But uh, Dwight says very clearly in an episode that, that we have no women working in HR. So mm. maybe she had a sex change. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we don't recognize her and that is also why we don't have any women in hr oh she was the only one okay. she had a sex change she now she looks like male. some other dude and dwight was just really woke enough yeah exactly know. how dare you <laughs> we don't have any women working in hr <laughs> yeah. i actually am realizing i don't know if that's the language anymore if like we say transitioned uh, know, as opposed to a sex change mm -hmm. i don't honestly know um, yeah, so I think had about two theories. One that she was an alien okay. gathering data on like office life or whatever <laughs> for okay. the human race, and just like didn't want to be part of the documentary. To right. Well, you have to like yeah, keep your you know when you're investigating, you gotta stay out of the limelight. Sure. If you're a good spy. Or yeah, whatever. absolutely. Uh, and then my second theory was, I don't know if you guys have watched the new series of What We Do in the Shadows, mm -hmm. yes. uh, but there's like the energy vampire character. Who, Colin Robinson. Yeah. And he just joins offices sometimes. Like, <laughs> yeah, he just definitely. goes in and causes like some chaos. So, so you're, you're thinking Luann is an energy vampire? Yeah. It's God possible. damn it. Say? That would be a good mockumentary right there. <laughs> The the is that, yeah, yeah. And that's why we only catch a glimpse of her every now and then. <laughs> Do you ever see her eyes like glowing a little bit? Like <laughs> yeah. she's feeding? Like... <laughs> like does she ever swell up with lightning around her or <laughs> anything like that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's it. Who is Luann? We, we never get much information on her. A lot of people think she is the Scranton Strangler because she changes her appearance and stuff, but who knows? Yeah, next one. Uh... <laughs> So the next thing is what happened to the senator's apple-eating son. Uh, on an early episode when we first like meet the senator who Angela Martin ends up falling in love with and like uh, getting married and having yeah. a kid. Orange uh, rimmed glasses on heroes. Yeah. The first time <laughs> we ever meet him on The Office with him at the Hey Day Festival mm -hmm. uh, is a small child who's presumably his son. I think he even identifies him as his son at the time, mm -hmm. who is enjoying this apple. You can see him if you're on our Twitch. He's and, enjoying it. He's taking a big bite. Yeah. <laughs> He's fully committed. <laughs> and this is the last time we see this little boy. What? Yes. So he never comes back in terms of the show, even though the senator's around quite a bit, even though Angela and his relationship becomes a big part of the show. And like you like see into his house and there's no pictures. I don't think we ever that. go to the senator's house by himself, but we like we see the senator a lot out in the world. Yeah. And, and a lot of times where it wouldn't make sense to not see his son. Okay. Um, so the question is, was the kid some kind of political beard? Was it just like a show for the public? For sure. Uh, or, this is a, a child actor for sure. But. Yeah, that's definitely a popular theory is that he was just there to give him that like familial sense right. that helps get votes. 
But uh, another theory is that after Angela and the senator committed to each other, she sent the boy away. Oh, she doesn't yeah. like kids? I she mean, only she, likes babies. She's wow. pretty she's hard. Like, you're too old. Get the fuck yeah. out. <laughs> she said, uh, and I quote, I wouldn't mind a pair of well-behaved boys. <laughs> mm-hmm. So maybe he just wasn't well-behaved enough for her. Who oh, knows? Man. It makes me think of that like horror movie that scarred me as a child. It's called People Under the Stairs. Oh, uh, I've heard about it. I've never seen it. Basically, this couple like steals kids and then they want to raise them as like the perfect kid. But if you're not the perfect kid, then like stuff happens to you. And uh, eventually you get so maimed that they throw you under the stairs with all the other like failed attempts at uh, like a perfect child. And then they're like, welcome. I am Guato. Yep. This is your corner of underneath the stairs. Please stay in your corner. <laughs> yeah. And then I think when it gets like the cage gets too filled, they like have like an alligator pit or something. Oh lord. All right. Well, we're watching yeah, it. we're yeah. watching it. What's it called? People under the stairs. People under the stairs and <laughs> <Ba-da-ba-ba-da>. <laughs> <Ba-da-ba-ba-da>. <laughs> what do we think it has on Rotten Tomatoes? On Rotten Tomatoes. On Rotten Tomatoes. By the way, I must have been in like the fifth grade when I saw this movie and it gave me a terrible name. <laughs> I'm going to assume... Or maybe like third grade. We're either. talking like 90s lower budget horror film. I'm going with 32%. 73. Oh, what? I'm going to just go 50 because I'm scared. The people <laughs> under the stairs? You're scared? Yeah. The people under the stairs? Yeah. I should have looked this up before, right? <laughs> 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 I got so into the yeah, little yeah. theme song that we put together. Hopefully people appreciate it and enjoy it. 62% from the people <laughs> under the stairs. Tristan takes it. Uh, 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 you scarred me, but I won that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so yeah, we don't know what happened to this little boy who likes to eat apples. He was taken. Uh, yeah. To me, made the perfect child. Just another mystery of the office. <laughs> the next one is, did Jim Halpert cheat on Pamela Halpert with Kathy, the new salesperson at the office? I'm not sure what she does there. To be <laughs> uh, but we see a night where Jim is very emphatically telling Kathy to stay out of his room. They have like a weird interaction. He just wants her to leave. She seems very intent on hooking up with him. Uh, and Jim ends up eating ice cream with Dwight while Kathy like beats on the outside of the door or something. I'm not really sure. But um, the next day when they go to the meeting together, they exchange this very strange look where Jim looks at Kathy and Kathy smiles in a very... Like I succeeded. Yes. She doesn't look like she was jilted the night before. She doesn't seem upset about anything. She seems like she got the D. That's the look. That's the look. That's the look. That's the look, the look of love. You thought you could resist. <laughs> you said I would never get this, but then I and then get. soon after that, Jim and Pam are in couples therapy. We see their relationship start to crumble even further. Things are not going well no. in the Halpert household. So the running theory is that Kathy came back later after Dwight went to bed, or maybe early in the morning, or who's to say? Maybe Jim went to her room after that because he realized it was going to happen or whatever the fuck. But it seems like something happened. At least that's what the internet thinks. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's, the that's what the trip. internet wants. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're, they're making something. I'll be honest. Jim, I mean, I've, I'm not, I haven't been afraid to say it uh, when we talked about the Scrant Strangler. Jim is kind of a jerk. Mm-hmm. Like, I remember when he... Uh, meets Toby after he first comes back from being transferred to Utica, I think. Uh, When he first comes back, Toby offers him, like, a fist bump, and Jim is like, oh, is that, like, a thing you're doing now? It's like, who does that? Who who wouldn't just fist fist bump somebody back and move on with their life? Like, (laughs) he's not allowed to fist bump Jim? I don't know. It's one example of very many things that some Jim people, does. I will say some people are opposed to weird things. Like, some people don't like high fives. So, like, I'm not going to give you a high five. You're like, what? Like, yeah, it's a yeah. high five. Same thing with the pound. Like, some people don't want to give you a pound. Like, I've been 
thrown out a pound and then I've received the, the clasp. Have you ever got that? <laughs> like, that is, like dock onto you. Yeah. That to me is the least playful. Right. You know, like if you're gonna like just if I'm gonna put out a fist and you just just like shake your head at that or like nah man I'm not doing that. Right. I think you're a dick. Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so that's Jim and Kathy potentially. Yeah. Uh, another big question mark for the whole run of the show, and it has a nice little fan theory behind it. How is the Scranton branch so successful? Uh, <laughs> Rob's way primed to click a button for my next picture. Well, it's because he slept on that one picture of them in the airport. <laughs> yeah. like, I'm not going to sleep on this. This ain't going to happen again. <laughs> I'll cue you. I got you covered. <laughs> so this mystery, why and how did the Scranton branch experience so much success? And what They're a paper company, right? Yes. So the paper industry is declining. Dunder Mifflin itself is going bankrupt. Branches are both closed and merged. So the company is not doing well. The industry is not doing well. And yet somehow this little branch manages not only to do well, but to increase its numbers every single quarter, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if there's that embezzling going on. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely one theory yeah. is that Michael Scott is figured out some kind of perfect business strategy or that Kevin is indeed fluctuating the numbers and they're not catching it. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which could definitely be the case. There's definitely been a few different things where Dunder Mifflin Corporate's been like, just sweep that under the rug. When Michael kiss, kisses Oscar, they just give him a lot of paid vacation and even a company car. And uh, <clears throat> there's quite a few instances. You must like have that. like some good dirt on like the head of the company or something like that to get sure. away with what he gets away right? with. Right? <laughs> like, well, what what is that relationship? What there? was the uh, Jan's job? I th I'm not totally sure what her exact job was, but I want to say like she's definitely a corporate. Yeah, uh, she's entity. yeah, she's like the, his boss. Yeah. So she's like regional. I don't know, the manager of the region or some shit like Probably, that. Probably, yeah. She's, so, uh, yeah, I got to assume she's, like, keeping his pay a lot lower than it should be or something. Maybe that's the case. And he's just, he's working for next to nothing and he's producing. So they're like, the you know, why not just keep him? Just taking advantage of him, basically. Yeah, basically. Because, yeah. like, there was one uh, episode where he um, didn't spend all of their budget so he had a surplus of money, and he was like, yeah, just give it back to him. And they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. You got to use this. as uh, maybe year after or quarter after quarter, he's just, like, giving them all this money that they haven't used for the quarter or whatnot. That could be possible, I suppose, because uh, the managers get a bonus when that happens. Yeah. 10% of whatever's returned or whatever. Well, that definitely is, like, a knock for him not being a secret genius. <laughs> yes. <laughs> The main theory behind their success is that the documentary film crew was buying large amounts of paper in order to keep the show going. Um, I mean, production does go through a fair amount of paper. <laughs> sure. Yeah, and I think it was an excess amount to the point where, like, we need to keep this branch alive. So, like, buying excessive thousands of reams to just offset the branch. So The weird thing about that show... Is that they filmed for, I don't know, fucking like 10 years or whatnot. What is this the premise, paper company? by the way? Sorry. What is, <laughs> like, what is the purpose of the, the TV crew? <laughs> well, that's what I'm you saying. You love jumping ahead on these mysteries, don't they, you? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get there, Tristan. Okay, We're going to get sorry, there. They sorry. filmed for 10 years, but it's only for one fucking documentary movie, not a, a whole show that they release. Uh, episodically, you know, so they have 10 years of footage for uh, two hours of movie at, at most. And so, I mean, like, not necessarily. I don't know how this was a 10 year production, essentially. Well, yeah, they had 10 seasons for you and I. Sure. But that doesn't mean it took over 10 years of their life, I guess. But you're right, that is a weird loophole that they like would take that much footage for yeah a production that takes 10 years i mean boyhood took about that much time yeah 
And that was just only a few clips each year. <laughs> <laughs> That's the one where they let them grow up like yeah. 20 years each time or something like that. Uh, yeah, every year they uh, they return to production to film with this little kid. That's pretty crazy and very ambitious. Yeah. So that's why you got to like see the big picture there, like the long the long game. Yeah, the way where you're, each actor is committed for 10 years is like, please don't die, please don't die, or something <laughs> oh, like that. God. Nobody get a tattoo on your face. Yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> but it looks so good. Right. <laughs> it's just a cute little teardrop on that baby face. Uh, another mystery or fan theory is that the office was poisoned by radon. On one episode, Toby makes a big deal about radon testing kids that Michael is continually throwing out. Uh, first, he throws it out because he thinks it's an ant trap, and then he throws it out because he thinks it's one of those things you tip over and it makes the mooing sound. Mm. But then he thought it was broken, so he threw it out. And then the third one he found, he was just annoyed by him now, so he just <laughs> thrown him away. <laughs> so the idea being that the whole office was poisoned by radon, and that's why the characters are at their peak craziness in the office and they act most normal when they're outside of the office and they seem to get crazier as time goes on which would lend itself to continual radon poisoning okay yeah so that's just one theory to explain all the crazy behavior on there yeah because i don't believe that the production company <coughs> bought all this paper to keep this thing going when all they were trying to do is get two hours of footage. They had it. They just stayed on, I guess, and just kept filming. Well, Assuming that they're affected by the radon, too? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of a cool idea, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't well, know. Well, we also got to take a, with a grain of salt what you're saying about it just being for a two-hour film. Because even though you might shoot something that you hope is multiple seasons or multiple movies, it might just end up becoming one movie I mean, or a dude, smaller project. You have no idea how many hours of footage reality TV people have to That's make true. a one hour show. They have a week's worth of full, almost 24 hours worth of footage on these people. That's and a good point. Cramming them down into like an hour and a half, two hour episodes. So, Yeah. Fair deuce. <laughs> uh, the next image we have is for the mystery, how did the two offices exist together? So they did exist together. Yes, because at one point, Michael Scott actually oh, meets with David Brent. Mm -hmm. I believe David Brent comes in to interview for Michael's job when Michael is moving on with Holly. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, and I know they, they meet up in an elevator. They have a little back and forth. They compare their racist Asian characters <laughs> wow yep okay. yep <laughs> and uh yeah that's pretty much it but it basically confirms that david brent exists in this world right or do we have some kind of weird mirror universe thing happening and david brent is some kind of cross-dimensional traveler who can go between or it opens a lot of questions is it dunder mifflin in the UK version as well? Actually, like the company name? Yeah. I don't think it is. I I'm I never uh, claim to be an expert on the British US or the British US office. <laughs> <laughs> the British they speak office. US on that. <laughs> they do speak. Thank God they do. I would never be able to follow it. I'm pretty sure it's a different company. I can't come up with a name off the top of my head. Mm. I would like to see an episode where like both companies go to like uh a work retreat or something like that and have to like meet their like alternate or whatever besides just these two yeah and maybe <laughs> maybe their paper company got bought out by saber who bought out dunder mifflin and so now they work under the same they actually in the uk work for wernham hog wernham hog yeah so it's some big old hog different paper supplier but still a paper company so okay yeah so that, that's... i would love to see them all go to the same convention the international mm -hmm. paper distributors convention or oh, something oh that would be solid that would be a solid one-off movie or something like that or even if they just sent, Netflix like special yeah, yeah the office uh reunion special yeah yep i would be into that uh, and it's also weird because if those two universes are acknowledged and exist, then 
somehow in some way the events of the UK office happened exactly the same as the events of the US office. So like Tim Tim puts, and Jim. Tim and Gareth puts uh, Tim puts Gareth's uh, stapler in Jello or whatever at the same instant. Jim right, is it's like almost a mirror universe, exactly. but the same universe. Yeah, so how does that work? That's the big mystery of it all. But that's Are a, they being affected by radon too? Maybe. <laughs> I don't think they ever mentioned the radon, but I don't know. Because there were more seasons of the U.S. than of the... Yes, by far. I think there's only two, two. maybe... Two in the holiday bonus. Yeah, which is like the reunion that's special, basically. Yeah. So, sort of three, but not really. I mean, they really, you know, props to you guys out in the UK. You really figured out uh, the best way to make a television show. <laughs> you do it, like, short, like, six or seven episodes, and then you do it for two seasons at best. You come back for a holiday one, you're done. You run after you're that. You're fucking done. <laughs> you make your movies and you make your money. <laughs> not over milking it over there. I mean, no, while definitely. While we're talking not. about camera crews creating things, whether they're British or American, how much is this camera crew liable for? The camera crew on the office nearly lets Michael Scott jump off the roof. They stand by while a pizza delivery boy is held hostage. They let Meredith catch fire and don't be the first to react or signal the people in any way. They let Dwight set the false fire that causes Stanley to have a heart attack and nearly die. They let Dwight ride his bike on a wire from the office to a telephone pole. I mean, their job is to get the story, yeah. you know? Like, is the guy liable for all the stuff that the Tiger King did? Oh, yeah, you're just there to film. There is... You gotta be... You got to separate yourself it's from like anything. like reporters. Like, they have to be unbiased. They got to just be there to capture the news, right? I mean, I assume mm -hmm. unless you're, like, I think you would have to at least try and stop a murder. Right. <laughs> you know, if somebody That's... was coming, you know, like, with a gun walking around, you might have to phone the police at that point. I mean, the same to a suicide or public endangerment or I think so. I mean, I don't know. Um. Yeah, I just, I don't... Uh... Yeah, especially like when uh, when Dwight um, or when uh, Andrew, you know, runs into Dwight with his car, like they oh, yeah. could have like straight up crushed him. <laughs> and they're like, no, we're gonna we're gonna film this at a distance <laughs> for sure. <laughs> it's an ethical question that I'm sure like a lot of journalists, documentarians, etc. face. face yeah. yeah. At what point are you responsible for what's happening in front of you? Because don't people also react to the extreme? dial things up to 10 if they're in front of a camera. So in that way, are you sort of responsible for the events unfolding in front of you some of the times? Yeah, I don't know. These are I, ethical questions that are bigger than this podcast. If you're a nature <laughs> documentary and you're out there filming a gazelle and a lion comes up on this gazelle, are you obligated to no. step in there? Right, but that's we're not weighing human life against animal life because the comparison doesn't work. Life is life. Yeah, but they shot yeah. Harambe, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm not okay with. But, yeah. uh, that's, again, larger ethical questions than we can handle in this. <laughs> Especially when one is endangered. You yeah, know, just, for sure. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, I don't <laughs> think anybody would put uh, any animal's life over a human life, no matter how endangered it is. Hmm. Anyway... <laughs> and, and here I thought I was just bringing light fun stuff to this conversation for the day <laughs> yeah I, don't, Brett, I want to take you away from your coronavirus fears and talk about Harambe <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> that's my fault 100% okay. anyway we'll get back to a question that Tristan asked earlier yes. why was the documentary crew there in the first place yeah yeah I just assumed it was just they wanted to get a document like of anything. There's documentaries of fucking what it's like to be 
a chef at a restaurant. And to your point, like, why are there, like, 13 seasons of 90 Day Fiance? It's like they went in with one, the intent of one season, and they're like, dude, there is just so much gold here. We cannot <laughs> stop filming I these was people. hoping that that was the case with The Office. I think it would have played for a better show if this was a season-based thing. Like, after the first season, some people are a little more famous, and they get, like noticed on the streets and stuff yeah and then the, as the seasons go on you know public opinion I mean, of you changes that based on, happen on like I was gonna say, yeah you, you're describing the final two seasons of the american office where the dif- documentary comes out we see people react we see people yelling oh it's an art dog it's andy was that two seasons they had that i thought oh, no, it came- it's at the end yeah 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 so then yeah it was That's- just the last episode or two where the yeah. documentary came out but i was like they filmed that thing for 10 years or whatever right like wouldn't it have been nice if they just released it episodically and people like that would have been kind of interesting but i think for me that was kind of like one of my least successful parts of the show is when the documentary actually came out mm-hmm. and we saw how people reacted and how it made them feel etc and andy goes and auditions for like American oh yeah, Idol American and stuff. Idol. Yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> and they spend so much money trying to keep the company afloat that they could never afford the back end, like post production uh, stuff. S- they could only afford to keep filming. They have the camera equipment already. <laughs> they they just can't afford the post, and then finally <laughs> Man, something that, pulls through, and they can <laughs> pay for the post production. That damn post always be the most expensive part. And they film. They f- followed these people to like dinner parties and shit like that yeah where i'm like it's not even just at their work they got like in their fucking lives yeah slice of life for sure and it's like for 10 years you were doing that for a document like did you get any of that you know their uh house parties that they went to and shit (laughs) and that i mean the jersey shore has been going on for more than 10 years again that's a show though that's yeah yeah Yeah. not just a two-hour thing it's like (laughs) I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'd be upset. It's Again, like they follow you're, me you're every day. S- you're so for hung years. up. You're so hung up on the idea that it's only a two-hour film, and yeah, that was just the first iteration. Perhaps there could have been multiple movies. There could have been a whole season that came out after initial film. Maybe the film was just the test to see how people reacted. Or yes, maybe they did film the ten seasons and then womp womp found out they didn't have money to release as much as they wanted to, and so they settled on a two-hour thing. Is there a two-hour thing that you can watch where it's like a compressed version of, like, The Office? That would be interesting, In two hours? Like, The Office's version of their show. (laughs) That would be kind of uh, easily accomplished, too, because they have all the footage. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, the writers stated that the reason the documentary is taking place is because of one employee who died by suicide, a character named Tom Peets. The employee uh, only was noticed in the show during a specific episode where they were taking notes out of the suggestion box, and Tom wrote that the company needs better outreach for employees with depression. Oh, yeah, and so the idea being that they were trying to figure out like how this company was dealing with one of its members' suicide. Oh. Uh, That's and... the most generally accepted thing, but a lot of people say that the fact that there were cameras at the other branches, cameras that followed them home, it doesn't make as much sense as... And I feel like you figure out that in like a couple of days that like, no, they're not. Yeah, <laughs> they're not dealing with it at all. Like. They... <laughs> Even when Michael reads that, he doesn't even, like, remember who that is. Phyllis has to remind him by making the Mm -hmm. gun motion in her mouth. Uh, Yeah. Well, I've actually now just thought of a theory that might not be on there. (laughs) Uh, The theory being that maybe The Office and... What we do in the shadows exist in the same universe. <laughs> Colin Robinson shows up to, you know, steal Look some energy guys. from the guys. Jumping on top of the fan theories. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be mad at Tristan anymore now that you're doing it. Right? No, I was just saying because they and they notice that this guy's an energy vampire, the film crew. And so now that's why they're filming the what we do in the shadows people. It's the same film crew for both shows. Yeah. It's a fun little fan theory. I mean, he's in both. 
and he's not always seen with the members of the uh, yeah, the guy who plays Colin Robinson in yeah. What We Do in the Shadows also becomes a warehouse employee yes. at Dunder Mifflin. So yeah, it's, I mean, it's plausible, potentially. And he's not always there, so he's just showing up like he does in the mm-hmm. show. Although he doesn't show up until, I want to say, season six or seven, somewhere pretty yeah, late. Yeah, that's so. when they find they find out about this guy, and they're like, we got to check this thing out. There's <laughs> vampires. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and the only other thing is that later in the show, when we break the fourth wall and we see the, uh, boom operator. Yeah. Yeah, when that stuff happens, uh, Pam and Jim are actually doing an interview and she asks, like, why did you guys pick us? Like, why are you still following us around? And their response is, we want to see how you all turn out. So, I don't know. That's We're invested now, so. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, honestly, I guess once you see Michael Scott's antics, that's pretty entertaining. And, yeah, maybe you do want to see how people turn out, I guess. But yeah, could have done that with anyone. Maybe they planted the radon and it was an, uh, an experiment to see how people responded to radon. And so they were, like, videotaping, like, the craziness that can ensue after <laughs> vast amounts of radon. That's solid, but, like, super shady and unethical like that. Yeah. Well, welcome to the government. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Uh, another theory about the office is that the office itself is actually hell. Oh. Yeah, and so... Like, I'm sure it is for some people. Exactly. Stanley hates it, that's for sure. And we see a lot of broken people in the office. I mean, they have redemptive things about them, of course, but, like, Meredith is just, like, crazy and drinking so hard, and her son, like, hates her. <laughs> and, like, I don't know, everyone on the show has something about them that could probably land them in hell. (laughs) Or or just like it's a a suffering existence. Like purgatory or something like that. Yeah. Just, I I don't know. That's the fan theory. I'm not saying that personally. Well, then we'd have to assume that uh, Michael Scott, I mean, because he loves Dunder Mifflin, he loves working there, and he is the boss. Is he like part of like hell's army? Is he like, yeah, is he a Satan? Is he a. I mean, how far do you want to go down the rabbit hole? But yeah, maybe he could be... Because it wouldn't be hell for him, is all I'm saying. He's like Satan's jester. I mean, I don't know. He's constantly trying to connect with these people. Like, and there's even a point where Jim and Pam know that he has something going on that night. And as he's walking out the door, Pam's like, oh, we wanted to have dinner with you tonight, Michael. And the only reason she's saying that is because she knows that he has to say no. Yeah, like, but ev- eventually they do, you know, learn to love him, and he loves working at them. I'm saying, yeah, like, season it's, seven. Maybe it's Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's just the theory. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another, like you were talking about, um, blended universes. Uh, the idea that The Office, Parks and Rec, and Dexter all exist in one universe. Uh, and the connecting force between all three shows are that the Saber Printers, the company that buys Dunder Mifflin and ends up pushing their product with Joe Bennett and Gabe and all that stuff, mm-hmm. they are the company that's on all three separate shows. Parks and Rec uses Saber, Saber Printers, <clears throat> excuse me, and Dexter, Dexter as well, their Saber products in that world. All right. So, and then also the other thing is that some people were suggesting that the cre- uh, the cult that Creed was a part of, because he says you have uh, you make more money as a leader, but you have more fun as a follower. <laughs> when he's talking about cults, mm-hmm. the idea is that he was the leader slash follower in the cult on Parks and Recreation that's constantly predicting the end of the world. Okay. They like buy flutes from one Ron Swanson and stuff. But yeah. Okay, and then the last and final theory left over from The Office, which is my favorite of all of them, because it involves my favorite character on The Office, is that Creed is hunting Nessie. Oh. <laughs> and I have a little Creed clip. I feel like he's in the wrong, Nessie Hunter. wrong spot. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, our special guest speaker will provoke you. He will inspire you. He is Creed 
Bratton. Two eyes, two ears. A chin, a mouth. Ten fingers, two nipples. A butt, two kneecaps, a penis. I have just described to you the Loch Ness Monster. And the reward for its capture? All the riches in Scotland. So I have one question. Why are you here? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so the idea that Creed is constantly on a Loch Ness monster hunt. It's interesting <laughs> that he thinks Loch Ness is a male, and most people assume that she's a female. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also wonder if the Loch Ness monster doesn't de defy gender altogether. Right, has a penis, but also... Vagina. Yeah, or maybe is asexual in its reproduction, like a worm or something. Okay. Who knows? Could be the something. Penis kind of... is just for show. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> uh, Creed is also quoted later on the show as saying, if I can't scuba, what's this all been about? What am I working toward? And people have attributed that quote as him hunting Nessie as well. So that's the final little theory is that Creed is a nasty hunter. Who's to say? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Creed Creed's one of my favorite characters on the show. He, If not my favorite character. Just show up, drop in a line. And we honestly probably could have gone through 15 mysteries just about him. Mm -hmm. But yeah, apparently he's hunting Loch Ness Monster. Yeah. I thought, you know, that's like our show. <laughs> like what we do. Uh, armchair hunters. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to another episode of Armchair Hunters. <laughs> you find anything yet? Well, I'm going to keep on sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> what about a show like Nug Hunters? And we go on the road to try to find the perfect Nug. The mythical, like... This was grown on top of a mountain by monks who cultivated the brand for 10,000 years. Yes. That Only kind of stuff. special bees have pollinated this. <laughs> yeah. You'll have to find out if we become nug hunters instead of high mystery. <laughs> yeah. I'm Colin. I'm Tristan. I'm Robert. Thanks for listening. Send us nugs. New episodes every Monday. Want more High Mystery? Check out our Patreon page, patreon.com backslash high mystery for exclusive episodes every Friday. Merchandise can be found at our website at highmystery.com. Stay up to date by following us on Facebook and Instagram at High Mystery for fan art, news, and upcoming events. Thanks for listening.